In this video, I'm going to be comparing two games in the CRPG genre to draw a general principle for good CRPG design. The two games I'm going to be comparing are the two in the title. It's Baldur's Gate 3 and Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. Now, two quick notes before we actually get into the comparison. First, it has to be said, Baldur's Gate 3 is not a finished game. So is it really fair for me to compare it to Wrath of the Righteous, which is finished and has DLC released? Not really, but I think people are comparing them anyways, and I want to weigh in on that comparison. Also, the principle I'm going to be drawing out has to do with skill expression in CRPG combat systems. And even though Baldur's Gate 3 is not finished, we do have a good idea just from early access the general direction they're going to be going with their combat system. So I think it's unlikely that the things I say in this video are going to be invalidated on Baldur's Gate 3 full release. The second note is actually a warning. I'm going to be saying some things in this video that are critical of Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous, and I just want to say at the beginning, and I'll also say at the end, that doesn't mean I think it's a bad game. In fact, I really love Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. I've been hyped about it, I've talked about it to my friends, I've told them to buy it. I think it's a great game. However, I've noticed that CRPG fans who are particular fans of the Pathfinder games, I think they have a bad way of understanding what's great about these games, and that leads them to be kind of prejudiced against Baldur's Gate 3 style of combat systems. I want to defend Baldur's Gate 3 because I think it's also a great game. So, these two games, I find, have really defined the CRP genre for the last year-ish. Naturally, I've played both a fair amount, and I've engaged a bit with the communities of both. During this engagement, I witnessed the timeless witch's best conversations that really are so important to CRPG fans. Personally, this is an aside, but I love this little quirk of our community that we enjoy judging and ranking the game so much. Judging games against each other is just fun, even if it's fruitless. I mean, if it's fun, it's not fruitless, right? And, you know, I've engaged in it, and I've argued at length with many people, for example, that Baldur's Gate 1 is better than Baldur's Gate 2 over the years. <laughs> so there's your hot take for the video. Actually, it's not the hot take for the video, because at the very end, I'm going to drop the spiciest of takes, so keep listening. Anyways, among the Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous advocates, I notice a common criticism of Baldur's Gate 3. It's just that the game is way too simple. That there is a dearth of build choices and this hopelessly limits skill expression, and can only be explained as a new trend of pandering to appeal to casual fans. Skilled CRPG veterans, you know, us boomers who had to actually insert CD4 to travel to Baldur's Gate, as God intended, and who consider it shameful to play on anything less than the highest difficulty, solo, no reload, no bathroom breaks. Baldur's Gate 3 isn't made for us, but Wrath of the Righteous is. Or so they say. Well, I am one of those bona fide skilled veterans, and I think that this attitude is stupid. So I'm going to argue in defense of Baldur's Gate 3's approach to skill expression. And in doing this, I hope to draw out that principle, like I said. In CRPGs, the way I see it, skill can be expressed in two ways. The first is in your build choices. Things like feat selection, class selection, attribute allocation, itemization, etc. The second is in your actual choices in an encounter. Which spell do you cast? Which enemy do you focus? How well do you juggle aggro? Things like that. So this is a really important dis distinction between build choices and encounter choices. And any anytime you have choices, you have an opportunity to express skill. Now that this distinction is drawn, notice how the first build choices tends to steal from the second. In a system where your build choices are extremely impactful, your encounter choices tend not to matter as much. As a thought experiment, imagine a game where you can build a character that is completely self-sufficient, takes 500 rounds to kill, and kills a minimum of one enemy per round. Does target selection or juggling aggro matter anymore when you can do this? Of course it doesn't. With a build like that, you can just turn on the auto attack AI and go pour yourself a drink. Every encounter is already won in the level up screen. Now, this extreme thought experiment game isn't lacking in skill expression. 
It's just that skill ex is expressed entirely in your build. For the opposite, consider the highest skill turn-based squad tactics game ever made, chess. Chess is extremely spartan with its mechanics. There's no builds, no fog of war, no variable powers, no dice. All there is are the decisions you make in the encounter. And the result is a game that is hyper-focused on one type of skill. It's a great game, but it's not a great RPG. So here is a very simple graph representing the tension that I see between skill expression in builds and skill expression in encounters. Chess would be here on the extreme of the encounter expression. Where would Wrath of the Righteous place? Obviously, it would place on the extreme end of the build skill expression. Wrath of the Righteous is easily the most lopsided game for skill expression in the history of the CRP genre. I mean, of course, I haven't played every CRPG, but it has to be, right? Pathfinder, the tabletop system, was already a highly build-centered system, and Wrath of the Righteous added the insane mythic paths on top of it. Let's look at a simple example in the game, which is early game armor class. All right, so here we are in Wrath of the Righteous. We are in Neatholm and just hit level two. This is right after the dialogue where you choose between Lan and Wenduog. I chose Wenduog in this particular run. And it's already at this very first level up that you can see the crazy things that you can do in Wrath of the Righteous uh, with stacking armor class. So there's a few pieces to this, all, all of them we hit at level two. First is we are going to level up Wenduog and select Hunter. It doesn't matter which kind of Hunter you are, as long as they have an animal companion. I can't remember if any of them lose an animal companion. We're just gonna pick the base Hunter. All right, in the animal companion selection, we will pick Leopard. There's lots of good ones, but Leopard will have the highest armor class. Spells don't matter to us that much. All right, that's Wendog. Now we have our animal companion. So I'm just going to level it up to level two really quickly. Okay, so already we can see with a level two leopard, we have 24 AC. And that's already a really good start, but we are going to find a lot of ways that we can buff it. One main way is if you have a alchemist as your main character, which I made in this run. And if you take the infusion, medical discovery, medical discoveries are for viv vivisectionists, but any alchemist, as far as I know, can take infusion. This allows us to cast the shield spell on targets other than ourselves, which we're gonna be spamming it on our leopard here. And then the final chink in the armor is Camellia. Camellia is one of the best companions in the game. If we take this right here, Protective Luck. Protective Luck um, basically opposes disadvantage on all attack rolls against the target for one round. But we can use it every round, it's like a cantrip. And this, this creates the main loop of our buffs. We will cast um, Mage Armor with a potion on the leopard, shield with our vivisectionist, and then in combat, Camellia will spam protective luck. Also, in combat, you can have your main character use the Light of Angels, which will lower enemy attack rolls by one. Altogether, this will achieve a armor class, a functional armor class of 36. It's actually 35 for the leopard, but with the negative one from Light of Angels, it's a functional 36. And we can get even higher if we find uh, various scrolls or potions. For example, um, Cat's Grace will improve the armor class even higher. But honestly, having a 35 is enough. A 35 means you need a 16 to start hitting this leopard on anything more than a roll of a 20. 
or if you're spamming a lot of creations, a 17, which the large water elemental that you'll fight, probably one of the hardest enemies in the shield maze, on unfair difficulty, only has a plus 16 to hit. Then, with a spam of protective luck, that means even the large water elemental, again, one of the most deadly enemies in the shield maze, will hit this leopard once in 400 tries. That means your armor class stacking, in even at level 2 in this game, is exceptionally high. You can make it so nothing really can hit you if it's targeting armor class. Now, of course, some people won't want to play an alchemist as their main character, but that's okay. You can still get very close to a 35 even without an alchemist if you have spells like Shield of Faith, for example. And you'll find Mage Armor spells, Mage Armor potions, rather, and Shield of Faith potions in the Shield Maze. I have played through the Shield Maze on Unfair with four separate builds. All of them use this strategy of the Leopard. It's, it's just broken. And remember, Unfair is not the typical way that you play the game. On normal difficulty, nothing can hit the Leopard. And it will stay ahead of the armor class curve for most of the game. Meanwhile, the casual player who does the intuitive thing and tries to tank with Sela and, let's say, picks the Slumber Hex because it seems cool, they're looking at an armor class of around 23. So, the difference between an intuitive, viable tank and an optimized tank at level 2 is 12 armor class. And... It gets worse as you progress in levels. Here's a screenshot I took of my Instinctual Warrior build, which is my favorite class, by the way, I 10 out of 10 would recommend. At level 5 buffed, I had an armor class of 41 and could attack 4 times per round at full base attack bonus. And I'm not even that experienced with the game. At the time I took this screenshot, I had less than 100 hours of play. I am sure a more experienced player could do much better. When builds can get this strong, encounter decisions are, by comparison to build decisions, unimportant. I know this is a very simple example, but I think I've proven my point. In Wrath of the Righteous, skill expression is overwhelmingly about your build choices. My experience is that most encounters were won or lost in the pre-fight prep routine. Interesting encounter choices were limited to positioning my units in choke points or in places where I can steal a few opportunity attacks or delaying turns to set up spammable combos, etc. That is some of the most basic tactical choices in the genre. But what about Baldur's Gate 3? In Baldur's Gate 3, by contrast, the difference between an intuitive viable build and an optimized build for armor class is about 2 AC. It's really just a question of whether you know the Sword of Justice Shield of Faith trick. Of course, defense is is more about hit points than armor class in 5th edition, but still, it's just not possible to make builds like the Leopard, which can tank aggro, all aggro, and never be in danger of dying. As the critics say, it is a simpler game. There are less options and more constraints on your build, and thus the gulf between intuitive viable builds and highly optimized builds is way, way less wide than in Wrath of the Righteous. However, the critics are wrong to say that this means Baldur's Gate 3 has less skill expression. Since you can't take rounds and rounds of aggro without a scratch, or burst down bosses with insane elemental barrage combos, you need to start focusing on what you can do in the actual encounter to get an edge. When I'm playing Baldur's Gate 3 at my best, I'm focused on a lot on how quickly to get an advantageous initiative order for optimal sleep, our hold person combos, positioning to be able to shove enemies into Cloud of Daggers, or carefully controlling aggro with a defensive fog cloud cast. You get the idea. And all of this, you know, it well, it goes without saying that factors like lighting, verticality, surprise, and hopefully on full release, cover, are important dimensions in Baldur's Gate 3 encounters that are completely absent from Wrath of the Righteous altogether. Wrath of the Righteous, for me, is like biting into a cake that is too sweet. I mean, it's a dessert, you want it to be sweet, but a good baker knows that cakes are better when there's a balance of flavors. Similarly, Wrath of the Righteous Combat is one overpowering flavor, and that is build complexity. It would be improved if they scaled back that complexity for some other flavors. All of that said, I am still sympathetic to people who find Boulder's Gate 3 builds too simple or constrained. In my opinion, the way forward 
for Larian is item design. Interesting itemization choices are ways to improve skill expression and builds without altering the fundamental 5e system that people love. But already, honestly, Larian's item design has been creative and interesting. Equipment like Circlet of Fire, the Speedy Light Feet, Staff of Arcane Blessing, Light of Creation, Spell Thief, or even Nature's Snare. These are standout items to me. If they can design more items like them, BG3 builds will be even more fun. Also, I want to say that despite how it may seem in this video, I think Owlcat's Pathfinder games are great. They are ambitious, fun, quirky games that we are lucky to have. I predict Wrath of the Righteous will be remembered as an important game in the CRPG corpus, a classic which will earn itself an audience for decades to come. In the end, I think neither Baldur's Gate 3 so far, nor Wrath of the Righteous, strike the perfect balance between build choices and encounter choices. They're both great games, but I don't think either are or will be, frankly, the best in the genre. The best CRPG combat system that I've played so far was from a game few people bought and even fewer appreciated, Pillars of Eternity Deadfire. So <laughs> I told you I would end with a super spicy take, and that's it. That's it, guys. Thanks for watching. If you want more CRPG analysis, please subscribe. I have plans for many more videos like this. I'm at a point of this channel where subscriptions really matter, so I would really appreciate it. Thanks again. Catch you guys next time.